Welcome to Idea to IPO. My name is Rob. I organize Idea to IPO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 100,000 members among all our meetup groups all around the world. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 2,398 events. By any standard, by any measure, we're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We organize venture capital panels, legal workshops, networking events, and more. These days, we're 100% online. We have an event nearly every day of the week. Check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. Our featured speaker tonight is one of the top startup and venture capital attorneys in Silicon Valley. And he's passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, thank all of you attendees for being here. I see it's a, it's a light group yet and people are still uh, logging in. So while you're doing that, let me just cover a, a couple of things. Um, we do this, I do this probably every other week for Idea to IPO. Um, and uh, as you know, if you've been here before, we're going to do an hour of presentation and then a half hour of Q&A. So if you have questions while I'm talking, down at the bottom, you'll see the little chat box. It says Q&A. Uh, type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, if there's something wrong with the presentation, type it into the chat box. Like if you can't see my screen, you can't see my slides, something like that. Otherwise, type it into the uh, Q&A box and I'll get to them at the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining here late tonight. Um, uh, kind of late for Silicon Valley, seven o'clock in the, in the evening here. But I know a lot of you are from other parts of the world and a lot of you from a lot of different uh, uh, different areas. So in a little bit after the after we get a few more attendees, I'm going to go ahead and take a poll. For now, I want to let you know this presentation is being recorded. Uh, at the end of the presentation, you'll get a link with the recording and the slides from Idea to IPO. You'll also be able to find it on my YouTube site uh, if you just look me up on YouTube if you want to see it there. So I am your speaker tonight. I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone. I do corporate tax and business. I'm resident in the Palo Alto office, at least theoretically. Uh, someday I will be when we all go back to work. Uh, so Silicon Valley practice and, uh, and you take your speakers as you find them, I guess. My presentation tonight is on startups in the down economy and it's gonna be heavily focused on startups. All right, uh, and one last thing, I wanna let you know that we do this frequently. Uh, tune in, uh, check in, keep an eye on us. It's about every other week we have a panel with the venture capitalists or we have a presentation like this one. Um, and so stay tuned, our next one will be, uh, I believe it's in the middle of October, but check the ID to IPO site. So for now, before I jump into this, um, I guess I'd like to know who's in the audience. So maybe you could just tell me anonymously, um, who are you? Are you a startup entrepreneur? Are you an established company? Are you an investor? We usually get, I see there's a few investors I'm looking at the attendee list here. Are you a service provider like me? Uh, maybe you're in education, maybe you're in government. Um, I'd like to get a sense as to who's out here in the audience. So far, it's almost all startup entrepreneurs. Uh, we have one person from a more established company, but uh, with 71% uh, uh, voting, it is uh, almost 90% startup entrepreneurs. Okay, well, we're going to probably, oh, we got one other. I can't imagine what category I missed, and so I'll have to work on that. Okay, 80% uh, voting, it's still about 90% startup entrepreneurs. All right, I am going to go ahead and end the polling. And actually, before I end it, let's take another poll. I guess I have to end it. All right, 
uh, I'd like to know where everybody's from. We are doing this uh, remotely through Zoom, um, through Idea to IPO Zoom. Uh, I'm actually sitting in the Idea to IPO virtual office, as you can see from my background. So I'd like to know where you folks are from. It used to be we used to have to we used to do these only for a very select Silicon Valley audience, at least when I spoke. But now we reach attendees from all over the world. So I'm curious, how many of you are from Silicon Valley, and how many of you are from other parts of the world? It's seven o'clock at night here, so I got to expect that's morning someplace. Uh, it's it's, uh, it's evening here, but morning someplace else. I'm expecting we should be able to get some non-U.S. visitors. Um, doesn't look like it. Looks like it's mostly U.S. Oh, we got some from Asia. So my content uh, is going to be pretty heavily weighted towards U.S. Unfortunately, I am a lawyer, so I do have a lot of legal content here that I want to talk about. I'll try to I'll try to restrain myself and stick to the business stuff. All right, with 75% voting, I see that 50% are Silicon Valley, 40% are other North America, and 11%. Uh, are from Asia. And uh, with more votes coming in, those numbers are changing, but only slightly. Okay. Um, I would say about what I expect, but I never know what to expect. It's always all over the map. Um, all right. I am going to end the polling now. And now comes the tricky part. I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. And I'm going to launch my slides. All right. Now, if you don't see my slides, you should chat me. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to assume that you can see my slides, startups in a down economy, legal business and financing strategies. And I'm Roger Royce, your speaker. Okay, you should be looking at a slide that says disclaimer. Just want to let you know that even though I am a lawyer uh, and some of the stuff I will say here tonight is legal, this is not intended to be legal advice. Um, um, you know, it's uh, legal advice is only for your specific fact situation. Okay, next slide. You are now looking at a slide that says summary, planning for a downturn. And I'm getting no chats from anybody, so I'm assuming that's right. Okay, um, here's what I'm going to cover tonight. Um, not all of this, but I'm gonna try and hit on some of all of this. Um, <clears throat> planning for a downturn. Uh, I, last time I gave this presentation, I described it as the good, the bad, and the ugly of what's going on these days in the world. Um, I'm not sure if I can describe it that way, but I am gonna break it up into three categories. You know, where you can find some opportunity today, uh, where there are some problems uh, to avoid, and uh, okay, thanks, Bill. I guess Bill can see me. And also what you really absolutely positively just have to stay away from. The really ugly things that happen when things turn bad like this. Uh, so let's jump right into it here. So the first thing I wanna kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, I gave this presentation about six months ago, maybe five months ago, or, or, or not this presentation, but a similar presentation on what to do in a recession. <clears throat> and at the time, uh, it was really doom and gloom. And we were all talking about this thing called the Sequoia Black Swan Memo 2008, because everybody said we're heading into the next 2008. Uh, well, six months later, since we all started sheltering, I don't know if we have or not. We'll examine that maybe a little bit here. I've got data going both ways. But, but the 2008 experience was really instructive. It was really instructive as to what a downturn looks like and what happens in the downturn and what you might expect. Um, but I think we can all agree now that what happened in 2008 is not what has happened now. Uh, in, in, in no ways is it what happened now. For example, as I'll show you later, um, I see a lot of startup entrepreneurs here. Venture capital dried up in 2008. Um, big funds gave money back to their LPs. Uh, they stopped investing, they pulled deals, uh, the terms got very tough, they all became very difficult to deal with. Um, that just didn't happen. It just didn't happen this time around. So I think we can stop comparing 2020 to 2008, and we can stop talking about the Black Swan Memo. That's not what's going on right now. 
Second thing uh, that I'd like to mention is that s several months ago, there were several very good organizations coming out with some strategies and for things to pe for people to do. And I talked about it as well six months ago. I said, you better be looking for your follow on capital now, right? You better be kind of thinking about that and conserving the capital that you do have. Protect your employees and your customers. Make sure that you're in front of that spreadsheet uh, doing your financial modeling as much as you can. You're going to have to be able to pr project. Defend revenue, you know, just, you know, at all costs, you got to keep your revenue up. Keep operations stabilized. You don't want people walking out. The government has helped us out a lot on that. Uh, reduce your costs, of course, and look for new opportunities. Play offense. I hope that you've done that. If you've done that, that's probably why you're here listening to me now. So here we are six months later, and the first question that I think we have, this is startups in a downturn. The first question is, are we in a downturn? So um, I don't know if I really want to count on CNN for my news, but it's always good for any kind of headline you might want. So I went there and I found, you, I found some doom and gloom, US economy post its worst drop on record. That was the end of Q2. Uh, CNN cited a 33% annual rate of decline if you measure April through June. That's pretty bad. That might be the worst in history. That sounds really terrible as of the end of July. So here we are middle of September and I Googled around and I found the FITS news today that says economy poised for massive expansion. They're expecting a 30% bounce in Q3. So are we in a downturn or are we not? And can I believe either of those sources? Well, so then I went to uh, Brookings um, uh, a recent uh, public, a, a recent article, and I took a look at some of their data. And uh, you might take a look at the article. It's you know ten things you should know about the economy, um, and this is very objective. And one thing they mentioned: the small business revenue, uh, even though I can't spell it, uh, is down 20% this year since January. That's pretty significant. That sounds pretty bad. Chapter 11 bankruptcies are up. No big surprise there. Although my startup companies, they don't bother going bankrupt, so it doesn't really affect my world. Um, this is the one that bothers me. New business formations were down in Q2, but they're still pretty high. And anecdotally, I will tell you that new business formations were down in Q2, just personally, because they just always are, but they're coming back. They've been coming back, and uh, Q3, I think, is going to be very strong. And finally, the biggest things is that venture financings are strong. And I want to get into that a little bit more later. But before I do, let's talk a little bit about the businesses. So with all that's going on, you know, how can we be poised for this huge upturn? So if you, if you listen to television, I mean, you'll hear the president talk about the stock market a lot and how well it's doing. And you'll hear a lot of analysts and a lot of pundits. And that's fine, I guess, although really only about half the people in the country own stocks. So for the other half, they probably don't care. I think it's as good an indicator as any, uh, but I've got some better indicators. I think the better indicator is, is how you're doing, not so much how uh, some abstract metric is doing. So how is your business doing? Well, it probably depends on what business you're in. So what have we found that's been doing well this year? It's no secret, most of these are no secret, uh, and uh, here at I, at, with Idea to IPO, uh, we do lots of panels with venture capitalists. Uh, about every other week, we sit them down and we ask them, what are you investing in? What's doing well? Which of your companies are succeeding? Uh, we just uh, drill them to death about this. And here's what some of the things that have come out of it. Okay, obviously, you know, e-commerce is doing well. And I don't mean just Amazon, although Amazon is doing spectacularly well. I mean, anybody that can figure out how to deliver goods, uh, these days. That could be farm to table. Uh, we're seeing those companies come back and do okay. Uh, delivery services, anything dealing with e-commerce, online services. And by that, I mean not only the real world products, but a lot of the services that get delivered online. Um, you might never have conceived that somebody would take yoga lessons in front of a computer, but it feels like everybody I know is doing that now, or watching somebody tell them how to ride a bike in front of a, a screen. Um, a lot of companies, and in fact, um, a year ago at this time, companies that, that really didn't have a chance in their product because people just wouldn't buy it. That's just the new normal now. It's how they do business. Food safety. Um, 
people, we've done several panels uh, now, and we've talked to several investors about food safety. And um, I'm not sure the connection is perfect, but certainly 2020 is a year that consumers became even more aware and concerned about their food and how safe it is and that it's free from contamination. Telemedicine, absolutely. Um, I saw a lot of telemedicine companies before, you know, I'm seeing a ton of them now. And of course, they've all got a new idea and a better way and a better mousetrap. And I'm sure that they'll all be huge successes. I'm just telling you, it's a big area. It's a place where people can do some business. And anecdotally, I will tell you that I've noticed that that the, the medical uh, business, the medical industry, you know, finally, you know, has kind of come kicking and screaming into the 20th century and is adopting and is using telemedicine. My doctor, for example, finally, after all these years, you know, I can just get on a Zoom call and um, I can complain about my back and he can tell me it's probably because I lifted something and then send me a bill instead of me having to drive all the way there and complain about my back and then tell them I lifted something and then go home. So telemedicine is finally coming along. Insurance tech, this is a big one. Um, so much going on in the world and in California that implicates the insurance business. That's one part of it for sure. But also the monitoring has gotten better. Um, and uh, the new models, there's new business models. Um, go take a look at a company in one public called Lemonade and you'll see what's going on in the insurance business. But it's a big industry. We've done panels for ID to IPO and there seems to be a lot of activity. Here's one you might know, might not have guessed, is, is uh, housing. Because of everything that's going on, uh, it seems that there are new models in housing. So if you've got a business that can make it easier for people to get houses, buy houses, share houses, rent houses, whatever that is, uh, I've, all of a sudden, I will tell you, I've been seeing a lot of companies that are working on problems around housing. And then finally, the big ubiquitous, you know, huge category supply chain. One of the things we learned from COVID is that the, um, is that the supply chain is very fragile, right? The supply chain is fragile and uh, it's very interconnected and one little thing goes wrong in one place and it messes everything up. And so a lot of companies are taking advantage of that problem to create opportunities and build solutions. Those are just a handful. I know you've got more. I know I've forgotten most of them, but I think the, the moral of the story is there are still good business, there are still good opportunities, regardless of the bad quarter we had from April to June uh, or whatever happens for the rest of the year. I don't think the stock market's gonna matter for you startup entrepreneurs who are looking at very specific problems in your backyard that you're gonna solve and commercialize. Let's talk about venture uh, because in my neighborhood, of course, everything is venture. It depends on how the, the VCs are feeling. You know, the, the VC sneezes and, uh, you know, startups get nervous. So number one, uh, these numbers are only good. They're from the Pricewaterhouse Money Tree. They're only good up through Q2, um, but you can see not so bad, right? Not so bad. Uh, in terms of in dollars invested uh, in number of deals. Um, and I will tell you anecdotally, because we do a lot of panels, every VC I know says that business is up, right? Things are up, the pace is up again. Um, in fact, we did, pan I, did a, I, I, I was on a panel this morning with a, a top tier VC who mentioned that um, felt like nothing happened. Just, <laughs> it's like 2020 is just another year in terms of venture deals. Uh, the pace is a little short at 2019 levels, but it's still near record levels. We're still, like I say, still a very, you know, if you're going for VC funding, there's a ton of it out there. There's a lot of money out there. Um, again, looking at 2020 as of the, uh, as of the um, uh, middle of the year, um, U.S. funding was off a little bit from last year. I think after Q3, you're going to see that pop up again. I think that's going to be another big number. Seed deals have finally started to rise. You know, when this first, when COVID first hit, seed deals were the first things to go, right? And they just, they just stopped. They came to a very abrupt stop. In my, you know, there was a pause. We finished the deals we were working on. If we were at term sheet stage, we finished. Then they stopped. They paused. The angel investors or the VCs, um, they waited for, um, they waited for valuations to decline. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. And then they pick back up again. 
that's what I'm seeing. So, uh, and this has started to happen as recently as Q2. So for those of you who are joining a little late, I know you're gonna have questions for me. Go ahead and type them into the Q&A box. I'm gonna to get to your questions uh, at the top of the hour, the end of the presentation. All right, so that's really the good. There's lots of money. There are lots of opportunities. There's lots of good things that you can make, do. I just uh, published an article in the uh, San Francisco Business Times recently. Now this well, now it's in the Silicon Valley uh, Journal called now is a great time to start a company go read it you can read all about this stuff now i do want to mention about the ways that we can protect ourselves so this program is over well the paycheck paycheck protection program is over but there are other loan programs out there because i probably convinced you now you should start a company and you should go out uh, looking for venture capital and building something well you're going to be thinking about liquidity and again i'm still on the good part of what's going on in 2020 and for you startup entrepreneurs, one of the good things is that there is a lot of money, there's a lot of government money. For you small businesses, it's even better. So let's talk about a little bit of what's out there. We did a whole program, several programs on this, in fact. So you can go back and, and find them, watch them on my YouTube site if you're interested. Uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, that ended uh, last month. So uh, you're not gonna be able to get any more loans. So now your game ought to be how to make sure that you can get as much forgiveness for whatever loan that you did have. The idea was to incentivize you to hire people or rehire people or bring them back at the same salary levels for 24 weeks. So you'll get some forgiveness if you're able to do that or something like that. And the forgiveness is not gonna be taxable to you. So you ought to be planning and scheming and figuring out how to make sure you can get as much forgiveness as you can. Not gonna talk much about PPP loans. Like I say, we did several hour long programs on that. You can go watch the videos on those if you're interested. Um, economic injury disaster loans. Um, those are still interesting. Uh, those are still available. Whoops, sorry there. Um, and this is for any company that can show an injury, including an injury from uh, COVID. Uh, they're for small businesses. They're, they're in the US, uh, not available for everything as you might expect because it's a federal program, but you can get up to $2 million um, you don't even have to have collateral if it's, uh, well, you have to have collateral if it's more than 25,000. Uh, 3.75% interest seems a little high these days given what's going on. And um, could be up to a 30 year term. It's a case by case sort of analysis. Now, we used to have this free injury advance that you didn't have to pay back. Just want to let you know that's no longer available. That's been fully allocated, so you won't find that anymore. And yeah, we're going to get into valuations in a minute. So just keep that in mind. Economic injury disaster loans. You know, what I really want to stress to people when they're talking about looking for money, government money, loans, et cetera, is that there are a lot of programs out there that people aren't really uh, very aware of, that it's worth um, keeping an eye on or knowing about. So um, the SBA has numerous programs and usually SBA funding is not available to startups because you just don't have the metrics. You can't secure it. You don't want to guarantee it, et cetera. But if you're a small company or even if you are a startup, it's worth taking a look at the website that I've linked here. Take a look at what's available. Uh, there are California programs that are available, working capital loans or small business finance loans. Um, there are several SBA loans, there are micro loans, there are loans that are focused um, uh, on, uh, <clears throat> um, that are focused on minority and underserved communities. So you might want to take a look at that and see what's available. Our California statewide working capital loans, the CDC loans, that's up to $250,000 for 10 to five years at prime. It's a high interest rate though. It's, you know, it could be 10% interest, prime plus nine and two quarters and SBA loan fees do apply, but check that out. All right, payroll tax credit. The other thing I wanna mention, don't forget that there is a payroll tax credit. If, if you um, are one of these companies that, uh, that um, did not get loan forgiveness, then you're gonna be, event, or did not get a PPP loan rather, then you're gonna be able to uh, claim, you may be able to claim a credit uh, against your federal taxes for some of your payroll um, for hiring people, um, um, uh, for keeping people hired during COVID. Um, this is complicated, it's complex. 
you know, I just want to make you aware of it. Again, we cover this in detail uh, in our other presentations. But um, keep this in mind, you might be uh, eligible for a payroll tax credit, and that is just free money. And of course, like I said, you get the tax credit if you don't get the PPP loan, so you have to figure out, you know, do you want the PPP? It's too late now. You've already made your choice, uh, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on this. Okay. I want to, I'm, you know, I've run out of time already, so I want to go a little more quickly. I've got a lot of slides. I'm probably not going to get through them. So I've talked about some of the good things that you should be thinking about. I want to talk about some of the things that might not be so good. Uh, one of those are what we call workouts. All right. Those are troubled company terms. Uh, you can't pay back your lender. Uh, you've got a, you know, a tough investor, uh, preferred stock investor. You need to offer some special types of terms. Um, your VC is not going to bail you out. They're at the end of their life. They've got no dry powder left. You need to do down rounds, stuff like that. So let's kind of jump into some things to be aware of. First, um, hate to bore you to death with this, but you got to know this, cancellation of indebtedness income. COD income is a term that you should know if you're going to be talking to your lenders. Uh, what that means is that when you have a debt and that debt is forgiven, you have taxable income equal to the difference. That's the general rule. Okay, so if you go to your lender and say, look, I can't pay you, uh, you know, the million dollars I owe you, how about you take 800000 and I give you a guarantee or something like that, uh, you got $200,000 of COD income. Now, there are about a million exceptions and ways to get around it, but you do need to be aware. Uh, we've, I've seen this over and over again and again throughout my career, and I've seen a lot of downturns, uh, people thinking they got out of debt only to get wiped out by the tax. In fact, by the way, just, just to pause on that, I have seen a lot of downturns, <laughs> you know, in the time I've been practicing. I started practicing law in a downturn in the Midwest in agriculture, and I saw a lot of farmers go out of business. In fact, I was the one who had to go foreclose on them because I worked for banks back then. Um, I saw downturns in the late 80s, uh, early 90s, when um, actually mid 80s, mid to late 80s, when we had the big stock market crash. I was on Wall Street at the time. That was a downturn. So I saw all of this stuff play out over and over again. I saw the downturn here in Silicon Valley in the 90s. I saw 9-11, I saw 2008, and it's always the same pattern. I'm not seeing it this time, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And some of these issues are not going to be relevant to you. So think of this as a personal downturn. Uh, look out for cancellation of indebtedness income. Call your accountant before you do anything. And by the way, you can have COD income even if you don't have the debt forgiven, if you just swap it out, if you know, if you just trade it for a debt with a different interest rate, for example, yes, that could result in COD income. This is tricky stuff, it's complicated. Uh, don't let the tax man take away all those hard fought gains. Um, don't wanna spend a lot of time on this, but I do wanna tell you there are about a million exceptions if you plan yourself into it. We hate to talk about the bankruptcy exception, but a discharge in bankruptcy uh, is not going to be included in your taxable income. The one we all rely on a lot is the insolvency exception. If you're insolvent, and pretty much every startup <laughs> at the beginning by definition is, um, but if you're otherwise insolvent, you may be able to exclude some of that taxable income under this insolvency exception. Let me move along. Um, if you're interested in this, let me know. I've got tons of slides and tons of materials on, um, on, uh, on tax attributes and taxation of cancellation of debt. I wanna get into some other stuff. Um, again, we're still in the band, personal investments and guarantees. So you've formed a corporation. Uh, the reason you formed a corporation, you came to me, you had me form a corporation and you might remember I told you, I said, form this corporation because if this business gets in trouble, I don't think it will, but in case it does, if it gets in trouble, the creditors are going to be looking for somebody to pay, and you want to stop that liability at a corporate level. You don't want them to come and collect from you. Okay, so that works. Um, that works really well. That's why you form corporations, subject to a whole bunch of exceptions and things you need to know about. The first one are contracts, right? Smart landlords, as an example, almost always want you to guarantee your company's lease. They want you personally on it. Your corporation is not going to help you. Your loan agreements will likely have guarantees. Now, here's where it gets a little bit tricky. 
uh, you're going to see limited guarantees. You're going to see springing recourse guarantees. You're going to see different types of guarantees. This is an entire body of law by itself. The one to watch out for that I want to mention to you is what we call a bad boy guarantee. So that's when you're you have no personal liability. You see it in real estate deals, or I have anyway, a lot. You have no personal liability unless you take one of certain actions. And most of these are pretty clear. Did you file bankruptcy? You know, okay. But take a look at some of these other ones. You lied on a loan application, right? You diverted cash from your company to some of your other obligations. Some of these are a little bit fuzzy. And believe me, if you default, your lender, if you got one of these clauses, is gonna be looking really hard for you to screw up to make a mistake. For God's sakes, do not lie on a loan application. Uh, not only is it probably wire fraud, that means it's federal fraud, um, but you're also going to incur personal liability when you otherwise did not have any. Um, um, I've seen that happen. Now, there are lots of defenses to personal guarantees. Uh, you tend to waive most of those defenses uh, with commercial lenders, but you ought to be aware of them because there are what you might expect some equitable defenses. You shouldn't be able to um, hold me liable on that guarantee when it wasn't my fault. You could have collected it, you didn't, that sort of thing. But question number one, do you have a guarantee? Take a look at it uh, and make sure before you pull any triggers or um, stop any companies that you're not gonna be called on a guarantee. Want to talk about force majeure because a lot of companies are defaulting now um, in 2020. 2020 might be the year of the default um, where, where people walked away from a lot of their obligations because they couldn't pay or, or didn't want to. So force majeure is a clause in a contract that basically says, look, if you can't perform under this agreement because of one of these reasons, you're excused. Right, so if the building burns down that you're leasing, well, you're excused from having to pay for it. Uh, or if there's a, you know, if the bill, if, the, if there's a riot going on in your building, yeah, you're excused from having to pay for it. You know, force majeure, act of God. I mean, you usually think of it in terms of earthquakes and hurricanes and things like that that keep you from performing. Um, what I found is most of these contracts, they have a force majeure clause, but somebody thought about this very cleverly 20 years ago when it was inserted, that ends up being more of a non-force majeure clause where uh, it basically says, this is not going to excuse you because this is all a matter of contract. What the court's going to be doing is saying, what did you guys intend by this? Did you intend to assume that risk? You could have a, I'm, it's gonna sound ridiculous, but you could have a force majeure clause that says, in the case of a pandemic, you know, the obligor will not be excused from his obligations. You know, it, you know, in the case of, uh, in the case of, uh, uh, what's a good one, uh, a fire or a riot, you know, you could have a clause that doesn't mention it. So I know what you're asking, because everybody's asking this, you know, what about COVID? You know, what about our pandemic? Is that force majeure? Depends on the contract. Believe it or not, I've seen contracts um, card these things out and say, look, pandemics are not our problem. Um, and I've seen contracts cover them. So this is all a matter of contract and that can work against you or work for you. Usually though, what I see is parties don't have a contract, right? They just don't have a contract uh, or they have a contract, but they don't have a force majeure clause in the contract. But because of the sheltering rules, the government shut them down. They can't open their business. They can't go to work. They can't operate their restaurant. If a force majeure clause is in the contract, they wouldn't have to pay rent because that's what a force majeure clause says, but there is none. So now what? Well, you're not done. We have common law doctrines. There's a couple of them I want to talk about. Impractability. That excuses the performance of a duty if it just becomes unreasonably difficult. And again, did the parties foresee this risk and did they intend to undertake it is usually the question. Very similar to that is frustration of purpose. Um, and it means performance is possible. You know, you could do it, but it's kind of irrelevant anymore. So let me give you the, the typical case uh, to think about um, a British case. That's how old this doctrine is. British case, uh, somebody rented a hotel room because it was along the parade route where the queen would be traveling and he wanted to get a good view of the queen. So he rented the room, uh, parade got canceled, queen didn't travel there. 
So he wanted his money back for the room. And the court said, well, yeah, I mean, the whole purpose for having the room was to see the queen. The queen didn't come. Frustrated your purpose, you get your money back. That's the doctrine. And as you can imagine how far it's been stretched. Um, now, I can't tell you if COVID is good enough for this or not. I get that question a lot. And this is a highly factual analysis. I really want to know a whole lot more. And what I can guarantee you is you're going to have an argument on your hands. When you raise that argument, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. I just want to tell you that, that those defenses are out there. Insurance. Make sure you take a look at your insurance. Somebody mentioned insurance. Um, look at your business interruption insurance if you've actually been interrupted. But don't be surprised if it carves out pandemics from something that they'll insure against. Again, this is all contract. What did the parties intend? What are your expectations? If it does cover you, you know, you, you can recover, you know, revenue, rent, your relocation, uh, your restoration, all of that stuff. You do have a duty to mitigate. So make sure you're working from home if you can. Okay, D&O insurance. Um, I just want to caution you all not to skimp on the D&O during these tough times. And I see a lot of companies make that mistake. They say, oh, gee, money is so tight. You know, I got to cut someplace. I think I'll just skip that D&O insurance premium because it's pretty expensive. That's a big mistake. That's going to be a big mistake because uh, as we're going to talk about in a little bit, there are ways that you as a director or officer can be held liable uh, for the debts of a company. And the problem is once the company, we're going to get into this, but it can be not only to the shareholders, uh, people you took money from, but also from creditors. Think about that, creditors, right? That could be customers. Um, so don't, you know, don't, don't ever skimp on D&O insurance. Anybody who serves on a board of directors these days without insurance is a fool. Sorry, sorry, but you just are. It's such a litigious society and there is so much risk. Okay, I want to talk about fraudulent transactions because now we're starting to talk about things people start to do and they get desperate. You don't pay the DNO. Um, you say, look, gee, uh, my company has all this money and it's got these big creditors. You know, I think what we'll do is we'll transfer that money uh, someplace else. And um, then, you know, the credit, oops, what did I do there? Then the creditors uh, won't get it because I will have transferred it to my shell company over in Cayman Islands or someplace. Okay. Um, that's one case. The more likely case is somebody has already got judgments against them. They're in trouble. Creditors are chasing them. They're dragging them in the court to ask questions. Um, where are all your assets? So they go give it to a relative. So you want to know what happens in that case. Um, here's what happens. Here's a good illustration of what happens. If you want to know what happens, you should go on Netflix and watch The Tiger King. Uh, because you might remember there was a scene when uh, the Tiger King's mother, that poor little old lady, she's innocent, she's elderly, she doesn't know half of what's going on around her, and she's being sued, she's being drugged into court, she's being just beat to death through discovery, and she doesn't understand what's going on and why everybody is so, you know, going to bankrupt her. Uh, well, the Tiger King show didn't say this happened, but I've seen that show so many times, I know it happened. Judgment against somebody. He said, I'm going to transfer this real estate to my mother because, you know, who would sue her? And that should work, right? Wrong. And I've, I've prosecuted those claims and I've defended those claims. Uh, and uh, you, if, you, if you're doing that to somebody, if you're making them take title for you in order to avoid a creditor, uh, first of all, you may be engaged in a criminal act. But more importantly, you're just ruining their lives as well as yours. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not worth it. We talked about contractual liability, um, personal guarantees. You just agree to be contractually liable. You co-obligate yourself. By the way, co-obligation is different than guarantee. With a guarantee, um, uh, it can be different depending on how it's drafted. With a guarantee, the idea is, is that you stand, you know, you stand liable because somebody else didn't pay the debt. Co-obligor means it's your debt. Uh, that sounds like a distinction without a difference, but it can have a difference when we start talking about defenses. Okay, here's the other one. If you walk away not knowing any, not remembering anything I said tonight, remember this one. Um, you got to pay payroll taxes. You got to pay payroll taxes. All right, if you don't pay payroll taxes, uh, you could end up personally liable for those payroll taxes. So 
So let's use three cases. <laughs> Club fed. Um, case number one, you are a co-founder, you own 100% of the company, you're the CEO, the CFO, and everything else. Um, you've, you've paid your people, but you withheld the payroll taxes, but instead of depositing them as you're supposed to, you say, man, this money, I need this money to keep us afloat just one more month and I know we'll turn the corner. All right, so you do that, the company fails, the IRS and the EDD, that's California's version, they come looking for the payroll fact taxes, which they consider to be yours from the start. They consider you to be holding them in trust. And they don't find it, and they go to the person who had the right to pay them who didn't, and that's you. So now you are personally liable for 100% of that tax. Here's another case. You're not the founder, you're the CFO. You just work there, but you decide who gets paid, uh, and you sign the checks and write the checks. And the CEO comes in and says, geez, I know we got to pay these payroll taxes, but I need that cash to keep the business afloat. Um, you know, I got to pay my people or they'll leave. So uh, we're just going to float that for a month. Okay, things go bad. Um, IRS and EDD come looking for responsible persons. Guess what? They got you now, the CFO. You don't even own stock in the business, but you had the right to designate that payment. You think that's bad enough? It gets worse. Here's another case. You're a bookkeeper for the company, right? You just do what the boss tells you to. You just keep the books, but you have signature authority. And once in a while, they have you write a, they have you write a check. And, you do, and you're doing it part-time. And you keep the books. You do it part-time. You don't hear from them in months. They go under. Then one day, the IRS and EDD show up with, uh, you know, with a proposed assessment for you because they will do that. They're extremely aggressive. Not saying they're gonna win that case. You know, at that point, that's where you need a lawyer to fight, but they will go after everybody in sight for this. Now, I wanna pause on this for a minute because it's kind of funny. You know, the EDD is how money gets, how unemployment claims get paid in California. And the EDD has been spending a lot of money this year. I heard a rap song today about this. Believe it or not, a rap song about the EDD. I, mean, I think the line was, uh, you sell cocaine and I make a claim, you know? So it's, you know, a lot of money and maybe perceived as, as free money. Um, so on the one hand, EDD is just giving money away. I got to tell you something. On the other hand, they're collecting it. And they're being extremely aggressive this year about collecting. And I'm going to tell you how, hopefully before we finish here. But if you're sideways with the EDD, um, you should be worried. You should be worried and you should be protecting yourself and you shouldn't be making it worse um, by, uh, by, by becoming a responsible person. All righty, other state taxes, you probably ought to know um, that most states have personal liability laws. I honestly have never seen anybody tagged for California sales tax personally, but I've heard about it. So I know what's out there. Um, California Unemployment Workers' Comp Disability, you can be personally tagged. Why am I telling you here, personal liability for credit cards, for bad checks, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because you're going to get to that point where you have to decide whether to prefer creditors or not, okay? And the law is very confused about this, and uh, all I can do is tell you what the rules are. There's no good answer. You're, you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. But the one thing for sure I want you to keep in mind is some types of preferences will result in a lawsuit against your company. Other types of preferences will result in a lawsuit against you. So I want to focus on the stuff where you have personal liability. That's what this stuff is. So I guess this is the ugly of the good, bad, and ugly um, of companies. Improper distributions. You can't be distributing money out of a company that's insolvent. All right, improper loans. Uh, there's rules against that here in California and most other places. Here's one that'll surprise you. Um, you might be liable for employment, for wages. Uh, if, if you've uh, obligated somebody to work and you're not able to pay and you knew you couldn't pay, or if you had the ability to pay but didn't. So um, be careful and it might generate a fraud claim. So that's the other thing. Um, well, before we get to that, a couple more things. Department of Labor, that's another organization. If, if you got a 401k plan, you got to make those deferrals. They will come after you individually. And the Department of Labor, in my experience, is a very, very difficult agency to deal with. Um, they want their money. Not only do they want to, like, more than that, the IRS wants their money. You give them their money, they go away. 
Uh, Department of Labor, they want vengeance. That's been my experience. So don't get crossways with them either. There are other types of claims. This is toxic um, bank fraud. Don't make any, you know, miss. Oh, here's one that a little that that confuses a lot of people. Remember what I told you? Set up this company. Um, you're not going to be liable because you got a corporation, but the company goes and you know it enters into a lot of contracts that it can't that it can't satisfy. So you say, well, what do I care? Go sue my insolvent company. You can't tag me. Well, maybe they can't. They can get you on fraud. And I'm seeing those cases more and more and more and more every year where a creditor says, okay, you're right. I can't sue you personally because I contract with your company, but you defrauded me. You knew you couldn't pay when you got me to turn over my goods or services. And that is a claim that is regularly made and regularly wins. In fact, I, I have an old lawyer who collected legal fees that way once. It wasn't me, don't worry. Um, and then all statutory claims, securities fraud, we could spend a whole hour on that. Uh, bank fraud, wire fraud, those are federal. Um, lots of ways you can get in trouble. I wanna pause on this one too and tell you two things. Number one, alter ego claims. Uh, every litigation attorney you talk to, they will tell you that you've got alter ego exposure. You, form, you paid me to form a corporation for you the, to, to isolate liabilities. I gave you this big long list of things to do and what not to do. Keep, you know, keep minutes, you know, have meetings. Um, don't commingle funds. You did everything right. There's this thing called piercing the corporate veil. And that's where, uh, and, and oftentimes, oftentimes when companies get in trouble, the litigators will sue the company and the owners on a piercing the veil theory. Oftentimes they'll do that, almost always they'll threaten that. And they'll say, look, you're not as protected as you think from those liabilities because I'm, I'm going to pierce the veil. I do it all the time. So let me give you two data points. I get that. I see that I, I work with startup companies. That means 90% of them fail. I've been doing it for 35 years. I've done thousands, thousands of them. 90% of them have probably failed. Okay. So that's thousands of companies that have failed. Almost all of them failed owing money to somebody. Um, Oftentimes, there's litigation over that <clears throat> because people aren't happy about that. But never in my career has anybody pierced a company that I've formed. Never. It's never happened. So I want to tell you this is a real risk, but it is a completely avoidable risk. And if you're careful, you set things up properly, don't make any mistakes, you shouldn't have a problem. Okay, fiduciary claims, second. This is one you're going to have to worry about. So generally, we all know that as an officer and director of a company, you owe fiduciary duties to your shareholders, right? You owe duties of loyalty, right? You can't work for two companies at the same time. You owe a duty of care. You got to be careful with what you do. Good faith. You got to act in good faith. You have to be obedient. You got to disclose. Lots of duties. Right, you owe those duties to common and preferred shareholders, at least with respect to their common stock interest. All right, um, we all know that, and you're all very careful about that. Here's the thing that you might not know that's, that might surprise you if your company becomes insolvent, you could owe duties to the creditors, not just the shareholders. All right, so what does that mean? That means that there's no assets left for the equity after you sell all the assets and turn everything into cash and pay everybody, you're only gonna pay some of the creditors and none of the equity holders. Therefore, you're working for the creditors, basically. And the courts will hold that. All right, so there you go. You have duties to creditors. That should scare you to death because that's a whole other class of people that you have to be concerned about. You gotta give this some thought if you're on the board of an insolvent company because now you've got two different constituencies that you have to care about. So you don't just pack up and leave you know, and say, what do I care? It's just a bunch of creditors. You don't resign uh, you know, and leave a company in shape and in, in condition like that. You know, Be careful about that. Um, given the time, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about troubled terms. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. So troubled company terms, um, you know, if companies do start to go downhill, we're going to start seeing resets to the cap table. Number one is most common is forced conversion to common. So the preferred stockholders, basically they have to convert their preferred to common so you can sell preferred to somebody else down the road. We see that oftentimes. 
Um, usually the way this is worded is that they can just by majority vote force that to happen on everybody. That's the optional conversion clause. The, the mandatory clause is when you have a happy event, you know, like a sale or a, maybe an IPO. Uh, the pull up, that's the idea that the new money that comes in, they get to keep their preferences from the old money. If they put more money in, they get to keep their preferences. Uh, it's like a pay to play. If they don't put new money in, they don't get their preferences. <clears throat> What's a pay to play? That's a term in a term sheet that says if you're an existing investor, uh, you have to invest on a pro rata basis in the next round. Uh, otherwise, you're going to lose all those rights that you fought so hard against me to get in the last round. Um, so you'll see those get triggered, you know, when we start to see downturns. A couple other terms I want you to pay attention to. So if you hear pay to play, that's what that is. If you hear full ratchet, you should turn around and run. Uh, that's an anti-dilution protection. The idea, typically anti-dilution protection for preferred stock um, is very weak and very watered down. It's what we call weighted average. Full ratchet means that, gee, if it's like a most favored nation clause. It means that do you sold me stock at a, a dollar a share, a certain valuation now. If you sell somebody else stock at a lower valuation later, I get the benefit of that lower valuation. Um, it's pretty ugly in practice. Do some numbers, you'll see what I mean. You can ruin a company in a hurry that way. It's why you never see it except in troubled companies. And even then you gotta be careful. As bad as that, as bad as that is, foreign anti-dilution dilution terms can be a lot worse. Uh, in particular, uh, Asian terms. It can be uh, not only, you know, if you do a down round, it's not that, you know, early investor gets the lower price. They get some fraction of the lower price, things like that. So don't do that if you don't have to, but if you're doing troubled company terms, you might have to. Uh, model it if you do. That's my advice. <laughs> Options. Stock price goes down, your option price is up here. Your stock value, your 409A price is down here. Now what do we do? We do a repricing. Trouble companies will reprice. They'll just reprice those options at the lower value. There's securities law issues. I mean, that's basically a tender offer. Um, and there are accounting charges oftentimes when you do that. So that's not something you should try at home. That's technical, tricky stuff. I think we're going to see a lot more of them if, if this downturn I've been promised actually hits uh, more of my companies. I want to talk in the last few minutes we've got about carve-out plans uh, before my voice goes. So carve-out plans, so what will happen is the company will get to a point where they know they just have to exit. It's not going to be a great exit. They just want to get out. And you've got venture capitalists on your board. They want their money out. Um, and, the, you know, and, and we just want to get out, take the money, go invest in something else. We know this is going the wrong direction. Here's the example, and I picked this up from the newspapers, so I'm not giving away any confidential information. Good technology, um, it sold to BlackBerry. Turned down some really good offers, uh, but then, um, uh, I'm sorry, it sold. It turned down some good offers, um, including one for 800 million, which was a lot more than the offer they eventually took. So why would they take, why would the board of directors take a smaller offer? take an offer for less money, right? Why would they do that? Well, in the lawsuit, the investors claim that they were just because the management got a big, sweet retention plan in the deal. And management pushed for the deal and uh, the VCs went along with it. That was the claim in the litigation. Uh, let me give you a better case where that played out. It's a company called uh, Trados, in Ray Trados litigation. Uh, this one is even more dramatic and uh, there's a lot more detail in it. And this one, um, and this is the one famous case everybody cites for this. Uh, again, company's trouble, it's time to get out. The VCs, they just want their money back. They don't care about the common, uh, but you can't sell a company without getting management to go along with it. So they put in place a management incentive plan. Under that plan, management was gonna get a big carve out right off the top to pay them a lot of money just for making this sale happen. $7.8 million management got. VCs got most of their preferences, the common stock got nothing. So they sued and said, wait a minute, that's not fair. You know, why does management get $8 million and we get nothing out of this deal? <clears throat> you know, what's fair about that? Hey, remember my fiduciary standards. I said that we have the business judgment rule for most companies, most of my Delaware companies, meaning that a court's not gonna substitute its business judgment for that of the board of directors. Um, 
And, uh, you know, business judgment is, well, this is what you got to pay management to get a deal done. And, you know, case closed, right? Well, not quite, because you don't use the business judgment rule when you have an interested director transaction. And I will tell you as a practical matter, almost every deal is an interested director transaction. There's something going on in the deal. You know, somebody's, you know, benefiting somehow that it's hard to find disinterested directors that are not under the thumb of the VCs. Okay, interested, direct, meaning the, the directors are personally benefiting somehow from the transaction. So what does that mean? Um, okay, it's an interested director transaction. So now what's the standard? It's not business judgment rule, it's the entire fairness standard and the burden of, shift, the burden of proof shifts. So you, the directors, you have to prove that the transaction was fair, it met an entire fairness standard, meaning a fair process and a fair price, okay? So that's the standard, that's the trade-offs litigation. That's why you have to be super careful um, whenever you do one of these deals with a troubled company and you've got a management carve out, which you always do. So how do we deal with that going forward? Independent boards, right? You don't want the same board on both sides of the deal. Um, you want to stay, you want to meet that entire fairness standard, get a valuation, right? Get an investment banker involved in, in the process. Uh, make sure you get separate votes if you can. If, I mean, I like to get extra votes, even though it's not required by the corporation's code from every class of stock if I can, and I want waivers and consents. Uh, I don't want them to come back and complain about the deal afterwards. So there are ways to deal with this, you know, forewarned or forearmed or something like that. So, and I guess just to close out in these last few minutes about um, other unsuccessful exit issues, um, we talked about tax liability, we talked about uh, personal liability, fiduciary claims, security law claims, contractual claims. And by the way, those security law claims, are, they'll come crawling out of the woodwork, woodwork after you've sold the company uh, and it didn't quite make the money that you thought it would. Now, let me back up because I skipped uh, some stuff about exits. <clears throat> All right, so what happens when a company is ready to exit? Um, how does a company end its life? It's not doing well. So one is what we call zombie exits, or zombie companies rather. Those are companies that they're not taking any more money, they're not doing business, but they just won't die. They just won't wind up and dissolve and trigger that capital loss for all of the shareholders. That's a zombie company. It's not a good place to be. Nobody likes being there, but sometimes companies end up there. They just kind of, you know, we call them what life support sometimes. They're never gonna go anywhere, but they just seem like they're never going to die. Uh, Trados litigation, that's where we have a sale, but it was a sweetheart sale. Bankruptcy reorganizations. My startups rarely do a bankruptcy reorganization. What they will do sometimes, uh, it's a similar is what they call an ABC, an assignment for benefit of creditors. Now, what an assignment for benefit of creditors is, it's like a state sanctioned little bankruptcy process. You don't go into a bankruptcy court. You do this through an assignee, but you do it under the protection of state law. I see a whole lot more of those for startups than I see, uh, than I see bankruptcies. Fire sales, of course, management carve outs we talked about. And throughout all of this, we definitely have to be careful about the fiduciary duties of, uh, of, uh, of the board and the um, officers as well to optionees, shareholders and creditors. Um, by the way, one question that comes up a lot is, gee, is the preferred stock entitled to any fiduciary duties as well? Um, because you know we've negotiated these sets of preferences. So let me leave you with two things. Um, number one, yes, but not with respect to the preferences. They're entitled to fiduciary duties with respect to the fact that they're a stockholder like everybody else. The preferences, you know, that's just some contractual thing that they negotiated. So we rely on contract law, which is a lot easier. And that leads me to the second thing. Another interesting thing out of 2020 that I've been seeing is I've been noticing the cases coming out of Delaware, which is where I form all my companies, relating to limited liability companies. And they've been awfully favorable to the limited liability company when we get into these sort of squabbles about what, when do you have fiduciary duties to your members or when, and in which case you have to basically act with their best interests at heart or when is just a, this just a matter of contract in which case you just follow the words on the contract. And I'm seeing a lot more cases saying this is just contract because you're in an LLC. 
So one more reason to like LLCs more than corporations. It seems to be a lot of flexibility in what you can do. All righty, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I am going to go to the questions. If you have questions, go ahead and type them in the Q&A box. Um, again, I am Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the international law firm of Haynes and Boone, resident in the Palo Alto office. I do primarily corporate tax and business, and that's me. So with that, I want to stop sharing the screen so I can get to the questions. All righty, question. Uh, okay, we have lots of questions. So somebody asked, what are contributing to seed fundings increasing from the previous downtrend? You must have been looking at, uh, uh, I guess I could pull up that slide again, but Anyway, you remember the slide. Uh, you must be looking at the slide. Uh, seed funding's increased from a previous downtrend. Here's what happened. I know what happened. I'll just tell you anecdotally, and I think this is what happened everywhere, is that when COVID hit and sheltering hit, of course, everybody did panels and presentations. And I remember hearing VCs say, you know, we're just going to sit and wait, uh, and especially the smaller ones, the angel funds, because valuations are going to go down to 2008 levels. So we're just going to sit and wait until things get really bad, and then we'll swoop in and we'll go shopping. Well, they sat and waited for a quarter, and that didn't happen. What happened is if they waited, they missed out on a lot of good deals, and now they're back, you know, so they're, they're making up for lost time. I think that's what happened. Um, I think as a general rule, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of money out there. By the way, that's the other thing that I didn't cover in this slide. The other trend that I've seen is a lot of new funds being formed. There were a lot of funds. That's funds, you know, with a D. <laughs> they're fun, but they're also a fund. A lot of funds were being formed this year, micro funds, small funds. People were pooling their money. I think they saw some of the opportunities and wanted to get in on them. So there is a lot of money out there. There's government money, tremendous amount of government money. There's private fund money. Um, there's angel money. And um, I think that, you know, a lot of people would certainly not like to be holding cash right now because of what's going to happen to the dollar, you know, given all the trillions that are being printed by the federal government. And if, and I personally, you know, don't think that I want to be holding public company stocks right now either, given how overheated the market is. So this is a good time, I think, for you to start it to be out in the market. What financial resources are available to non-U.S. citizens doing business in the U.S.? Well, unfortunately, not a lot. You can't get a PPP loan. You can't get a SBA loan. These are really available to, to U.S. companies primarily. Uh, what is available, though, is private money. The other thing that COVID has changed is that everybody's used to doing deals online, uh, just meeting people virtually. And I've talked to many VCs now who have closed deals, big rounds, with founders they've never met who are not even in the country. They're in another country altogether. So that's become way easier. It, there was a time when you just couldn't do that at all. Just forget it, it just wasn't going to happen. So those financial resources are available. Um, and if you Google around or if you email me, I'll send you some links, but you know, some angels are just, they're just operating online. They're just got websites and say, actually several of them, I uh, think about it. And they say, hey, send me a pitch deck. I'll look at it. Um, <clears throat> somebody wants to do business in India. Should we start in an entity in India? Well, this is a little far afield. First of all, I think it's a great time to start a company. Um, I think India is certainly, certainly hot. It's a big economy. I think uh, it's a great place to outsource if that's what you're doing. Um, I would certainly start an entity in any country, any foreign country, uh, just for that liability shield that we talked about. Um, but I think you want to have the parent company be a Delaware corporation because that's what the VCs are going to invest in. So uh, yes, I think it's necessary to start a company, a corporation in country where you're actually doing business. Yes, I think you ought to have a Delaware, LLC, a Delaware corporation as a parent so that you can easily go down and solicit funds if that's your that's your exit plan. Is COVID force majeure? We talked about that. I don't know. It depends who you ask. Um, it depends on the contract. Uh, I think if you've got a contract that, uh, I don't know if the COVID is force majeure. I think the sheltering certainly is. 
unless the contract says something else. Because I've um, seen a lot of uh, a lot of businesses that were not obligated to pay their rent because the government closed them down, and the force majeure, you know, includes uh, you know government uh, government action. So uh, yeah, indirectly, I think the COVID could be force majeure. If you're a landlord, your tenant stops paying. Well, okay, so we got so um, so someone wants to know about landlord tenant. The tenant stopped paying rent, and you can't evict them. You know what can we done can be done. Um, uh, I'm guessing that you're all lucky enough to be here in California. Uh, it's a tough time for landlords. There's no doubt about it, and it's getting worse. I'm sure you probably, if you're a landlord, you know about it more than I do. You know that there is a state eviction moratorium. You know there's all sorts of relief for tenants, not so much for landlords right now. Um, and I don't have a silver bullet for that. I just don't have any good options for you uh, other than uh, the stuff that we talked about, the PPP loans, the idols, uh, stuff like that. Um, hopefully Sacramento will come along and try to um, give you some relief in making your payments to the lenders uh, or something like that. But this is not gonna be good for landlords or tenants for that matter because after the eviction uh, moratorium is over, you're gonna have a bunch of tenants who owe a bunch of money, right? That they can't pay to a bunch of landlords who can't collect it. Yeah, this is, uh, I'm glad you raised that. I mean, this is one aspect. I said some industries win, some lose, some are gonna be good, some are gonna be bad. This is something that is going to be every bit as bad as 2008, what's going to happen in real estate, I think. Uh, it's certainly legally, it's gonna be a legal Armageddon of, of lawsuits and, and you know, mass settlements and clogging the courts but that's a little far afield on my startup stuff. All right. What is the percentage of co-founders, advisors, officers in the cap table? Um, you know, you can go online and find, and if you, if you wanna chat me or email me, in fact, I'll send everybody my contact information. You'll find several calculators that will give you a lot of what ifs. Uh, there are rules of thumb, keep in mind, these are all just rules of thumb, thumb here. Um, and uh, every situation is different depending on your particular circumstances. But having said that, there are calculators that will, uh, will give you some of those rules of thumb and I think they're a good place to start. Now, um, co-founders, I do a whole presentation with Rob on how to split up equity among those three constituencies. So let me talk about that a little bit. Co-founders, you could split co-founders equally. I think that's a bad way to do it. Um, that's probably the most common. So look, you got three co-founders, they each have one third. Another way, that's equal split. That's the most common. It's also the worst. Uh, another way of doing it is a negotiated split, right? I'm not sure that's much better. This means whoever is the better negotiator or, or pushiest is gonna have the most equity. That doesn't mean everyone's gonna feel fair about it. A third way of doing it is having some sort of formula. Saying, look, um, I'm working full time on this business, you're working half time, I get two thirds, you get one third, something like that. That's better, it's fair, it's a formula. And the final way, and something that I do from time to time, is called a dynamic split. And it's where you have a formula, but that uh, potential split changes uh, from day to day, depending on how much you actually put into the company. So you could end up in a much different place than where you started. There are tax issues all over the place in doing that, but it can be done. And I do it if you're willing to live with the complexity. And then finally, you could just use my favorite little limited liability company. We can have profits interests all over that do this stuff really easily. Uh, as far as advisors, I, I, my rule of thumb is a quarter of 1% for a true advisor, by the way, <clears throat> that's someone who's not an advisor, but that can go all the way up to 2% if it's a real superstar. Um, I have a client company has an A-list Hollywood star as an advisor, this guy's not gonna lift a finger, he got 4% just for lending his name. So go figure, so it's all over the place. But I like to start with a quarter percent, maybe go up to one uh, for most, <coughs> but um, I see it go up to two for luminaries. Um, C-suite people, you got CTO, CFO, that just totally depends on the stage of the company and how much you're paying them in cash, if anything, uh, and how, you know, how much they're going to contribute. 
But check out one of the calculators. Um, it'll show you how to do it. Okay, valuations are down. Should some overvalued startups restructure to be fair to all? Yeah, they're not gonna have much of a choice um, because they're not gonna raise money um, at the higher valuation. So they're going to have to do down rounds. Um, so the real question here is are valuations down? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I think they were last summer. I don't know if they are today. I can tell you that safe caps came down, um, or at least uh, they did last summer anyway, and they've seemed to not, you know, they stopped going up so much. Valuations, I just really think that depends on the company itself. Um, but yeah, if your valuation has gone down, meaning you can't find investors to put more money into it, um, a restructure is fair, but you're going to, you're not just going to do that. You're going to do that in the context of squeezing more money out of your investors. Let's talk about pay to play. So I can tell you what I mean by that. Okay. And this has happened to me so many times that uh, it just makes me cry. So you go into the company, you bought in at $50 million valuation. Then COVID happens and now the company's worth 20 million and the company's out of money and it needs money. So it comes back to me and it says, hey, Mr. Investor, uh, so we don't go broke. We need you to put more money in. And I say, forget it. I'm not putting more money into this thing. I said, I got my liquidation preference. I'm just going to sit back and take my preference. And they say, well, no, because that term sheet you signed or those documents you signed, they have a pay to play provision which says if you don't put more money in, your pro rata share in the next round, all of your preferred stock converts to common. And it converts to like a small number of common. So you started off with all of this. Um, now you've got this little piece. So what do you say? You want to put some more money in now? Yeah, then I think I do because I need to preserve my preferences. So that's a pay to play. So that's the kind of stuff that companies are going to do. That's the kind of restructurings they're going to do. Uh, and I don't know if that's fair at all. It certainly doesn't feel fair to me, but that's, that's what happens uh, in, in companies sometimes in pay to play. Now, suppose you don't have pay to play um, and the company's troubled and uh, you need to go out and raise some more preferred stock, but God, you get so many preferences now because you say you've sold you know, millions and millions of dollars of preferred stock so there's all these preferences. The preferences are worth more than the company. So there's not much left over for the founders, right? So now what are you going to do, right? I mean, who would even invest in that? And I've seen deals tank because forget it. There's too many. The preference stack is too high. The founders have no incentive. We don't think they'll stick around. A lot of times the founders will because I don't know why. I don't know who they think they're working for. But the investors figure it out and say, and later investors, they say, we don't think your founders are going to stick around once they figure out how, how bad they're getting screwed. What do you do? You do a conversion. You convert that pre-existing preferred stock to common. So now they're not ahead of the founders. They're just Perry Pursue. Then the next money comes in on a preference, as a preference, right? So that's what you really have to do in a case like that. Or at least that's one way. That's one way to fix the problem. And certainly we see that from time to time. Um, what else we got? More details of how the corporate veil is lifted. Are there cases you've seen in high technology? Well, again, um, my experience is that is always threatened, but rarely happens. Um, and I know there's going to be a lot of people that want to disagree with me. They're going to tell you some anecdote about it, it happening. But if it did happen, it's probably because there was commingling. And I've read the cases, you know, and that's where they get them. Um, they're not going to lift your corporate veil because you made an S election, although I've seen that argued in the case law. You know, they're, you know, they they will say you should observe corporate formalities, meaning you should keep minutes. But let's be honest, how are your minutes? Okay, um, I think if it gets if the corporate veil gets lifted, the courts will follow the money. That's what that's where I've seen it happen, and um, that's an easy one because you know, I mean, you know, uh, you know how to stay out of trouble in that way. And what do I mean by follow the money? So investors' money went into the company. Uh, founder caused the company to give that money to one of his affiliates, which, by the way, that just happened to me this summer. I'm not going to say which company. Uh, and I'm not litigious, so I'm not going to do anything about it. But, you know, I'll bet you a dollar to a donut somebody else does, because that's what you can't do. You can't put money in one company 
and see it go out the back door into another company to build up a great business. First company fails, second business does great. Well, yeah, you're gonna pierce the veil. The creditor of the first company is gonna say, wait a minute, you know, I should have some, you know, I should, you know, have a claim against that second company that built its business off my back. So that's how the corporate veil is typically lifted. And that's how it happens in high technology and low technology and, and all of this stuff. So that's what you really want to be careful of. Now, on top of that, do the easy stuff. You know, have all your documents in order, have meetings, have board meetings, have minutes. You know, every year, uh, it'd be nice, it's good practice to have an annual meeting at least once a year of the shareholders. Get together, approve leases, you know, select a board. Have the board for sure get together frequently and approve major transactions. It'll all help, you know, it'll all help when somebody drags you before a judge and says, judge, you should ignore this corporation because they didn't even pay attention to it. But for sure, the number one biggest thing on this is don't commingle. You know, you keep your corporate money separate from your personal money. All right, here's a good question. How much of this stuff should I remember? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. Um, you don't have to remember much of it because you can actually get my book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup. And everything I just said is in this book. Uh, and if you email me, I'll send you a free digital copy. Um, but uh, you know, you can also have a hard copy with my picture on it just like this. You can have one of these. Yes, you can. All you have to do is go to Amazon and buy one. But if you'd like a digital copy, just email me and I'll send it to you. Um, but seriously, you, you're doing the right thing by coming to presentations like this. Um, you're doing the right thing for educating yourself. You're doing the right thing for going out and learning all of these issues. Because I can promise you, your lawyer is not going to tell you this if you don't ask the right questions. Right, so um, you know, you know, information is definitely power, especially when we're in these really transitional times. So uh, do as much of this sort of education as you can. Read the blogs, listen to the videos, um, and by the way, the book is on audio. You can listen while you're jogging, you know, wearing your mask, running down the street if you want. Uh, but you know, make sure you're aware of these issues so you know what questions to ask. <clears throat> Okay, somebody asks, um, uh, safes are out, convertibles. Let me try to, uh, our, I think they mean are safes out. Uh, convertibles and seed best value or warrants and down around where the tier one venture has the head in the sand. Um, well, what are that do I want to talk about? Let's talk about safes. Um, I, I, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen safes being out. I think they're just as in as ever. Um, what is a little bit different as to which form of safe people are using. Um, unfortunately, Y Combinator went out and put out a form of safe, what they call the post money safe, that is just so easy to go download and give away way more of your company than you thought. Um, so a lot of entrepreneurs are using a Y Combinator safe, believe it or not, a lot of lawyers are letting them do it. Uh, I think it's a terrible form for the founder. That's just my personal feeling. I think you should not use any, first, I don't think you should use anything you can download off the internet. Um, and if you do, you should go read the blogs, check out some of our presentations that we've done for ID to IPO on safes, find out what the difference is. It's complicated, it's tricky, there's a lot of math, but the concept's very simple. Um, you want a safe, it's better for you, the company, to have a pre-money safe. In other words, that's where somebody gives you a safe that will convert at a valuation that is determined um, before taking into account the dilution from the option pool and before taking into account um, uh, all the new money that comes in. So the post-money safe is just the opposite. It says, yeah, we're going to convert, you know, into stock at a X dollar valuation post money after all that stuff happens. So in other words, you could have a humongous option plan or a small option plan. Doesn't matter. I still get X percent of the company. I think I think they're just they're just they're, they're lunacy. They're just nonsensical. But that is getting to be the standard. 
So that's SACE. Um, now, if you're an investor, you love it. You know, that's what you want. And the argument is, well, that's the standard. That's what everybody uses. Um, and that's a good argument. At least you know, you can tell the investor exactly what they got. So here's the plus side. You can model a lot better with those because you know exactly what you've given away. All right, um, convertibles and warrants and down rounds. So I, I rarely see a convertible note anymore, you know, rarely. Um, and the people that do use them, use them against my advice typically. Uh, maybe we'll do it to, as a true bridge between two rounds where you're, you know, you're the bridge so the company can get to the next round that's imminent. But otherwise, um, no, nah, we just don't do that. Now, seed sage uh, deals, uh, series seed preferred, that's another issue. Um, that's where you just value the company and you issue a very watered down preferred stock to the investors instead of a safe convertible uh, or a note. And uh, that I do see a lot of, and I have no problem with that at all. I don't mind doing that. I kind of like it because um, the safes have just gotten to be more complicated, and more tricky, and people aren't understanding what they're getting with them. So I, I love the simplicity uh, I love the simplicity of preferred stock, in effect. I love the simplicity of Series C compared to all the options you have with a safe. Now, we haven't even talked about pro rata rights and how that differs between a pre and a post money. It's a lot of ways you can end up with something you didn't expect. All right, <clears throat> here we have an S Corp um, in California. Its headquarters are in California. Uh, where should it incorporate? Um, all right, so 99% of the companies I form, and thanks for all the great questions, by the way. 99% um, of the companies I form are formed under Delaware law. And uh, even if they're 100% in California, it's, it's Delaware law. Um, and there's lots and lots of reasons for doing that. So let me give you the top three, I guess. Uh, the top one is that if you plan on taking venture funding, they're going to want you to be a Delaware corporation. They're going to make you reincorporate anyway. So you might as well start in Delaware. That's the number one reason, because most of the companies I deal with, they're going for venture, they're going for the gold, right? Um, second reason is um, fiduciary duties. Delaware is very clear about fiduciary duties and uh, and uh, what those duties are and who has them and uh, who's responsible to who for what. Um, other states are not quite so clear. They don't have quite as much case law. And Delaware has a reputation for interpreting the law as it's written. So that's generally viewed as a good thing. Um, investors like that, founders like that, who doesn't like that? You know, I guess plaintiff's lawyers don't like that. Activist judges don't like that, but I like that. And everybody else does. So second reason for Delaware. Third reason is I like dealing with their corporations commissioner. Uh, I think they're a little easier than a lot of other states. Um, and the fourth reason, uh, if I haven't already said it, it's you can abrogate class voting in Delaware. And that's the biggest reason everybody goes there. And that's the idea that in California, for example, if somebody has a class of shares of stock, even non-voting stock, by the way, here's a shocker for you. You know, you think you're so clever, you give someone non-voting stock in your California corporation, well, they have a statutory right to vote on certain actions like a merger or sale of the company. So you can abrogate that in Delaware. You can just have your article say, we all vote together as one big share and I get a hundred votes and you get nothing that'll matter. So you can do that in Delaware. You all vote together in one big pot. You can't do that in California. You can't do that in a lot of states. So people want to have that flexibility so that that one shareholder with that one other class of stock can't hold you up and stop your deal. All righty, somebody wants to know how much um, they should budget for legal costs. Um, that's like asking how much does a house cost? Um, so, and would you recommend having a legal person as an equity holder? Well, if you can talk somebody into it, I suppose. Um, so so here, here's the thing. Um, this is tricky stuff because startups are different and startup law is different and startup legal is different. And you don't want to be on either end of the spectrum. You don't want to have, you know, you don't want to have the cheapest corporation in town. 
you don't want to go online and buy a $200 corporation and think that you're secure because you're not. I'll just tell you, you're not. You think you are, but you're not. Uh, but you did save a lot of money. On the other hand, I'm not even making this up. I know somebody who hired a firm who doesn't do startup work. They do, you know, bond deals worth hundreds of billions of dollars and it costs them a hundred thousand dollars to form our corporation in legal fees a hundred thousand dollars you don't want that guy either you really want a startup lawyer and the good thing about silicon valley is that the the valley is full of them right it's what we do here and we all know what you know what is fair pricing we know what is startup friendly uh and startup friendly pricing and some of us will even give you fixed fees and fix, fixed budgets and say, this is what you need, this is what it's gonna cost, and this is one you can pay me. And then you've got certainty. Um, so, um, so to say what you should budget, it kind of depends what you need. And, and my process is to sit down with people and I just have a little checklist and it's like a Chinese menu, you know, just pick one from column A and one from column B. You tell me what it is you want, I'll help you with that. I'll tell you what you should have <laughs> and then you tell me you want that and I'll tell you what it'll cost and when you're going to get it and when you have to pay me. Um, that's that's a better way of doing it. Now you can give your lawyer a stock in your company. If the company fails then you made a great deal. It didn't cost you anything. Um, if the company succeeds uh, you're going to be so sorry that you gave away a million dollars worth of stock. Uh, you know I had that um, I have people offer me stock a lot and uh, one company, rarely do I take it, but every once in a while, one company about five, six, maybe longer than five, six years ago, uh, I suggested it because uh, I could see where they were going. And they said, no, they said, no, we want to pay you in cash. My investor won't let me give you stock. You do take cash, don't you? And I said, well, I suppose I do. But looking back on it, we did quite a bit of work. I don't know, maybe, been, maybe it was a $5,000 incorporation with stock issued. If I had taken the stock, uh, it would be worth millions. You were millions. So, you know, that's that's a game. Uh, but I don't do that anymore, by the way. I wouldn't, I, I'm not allowed to take stock for fees. Um, okay, we have uh, one, two last questions here. Uh, what point should the startup have a board of advisors? Um, yeah, so um, I'm a big believer in advisors. I'm a big believer in co-founders, but you want advisors um, to, well, the questions really took a startup turn here, didn't they? We'd even talk about all the gloom and doom. You want advisors uh, fairly soon to lead you in the right direction. The advisors role, they're gonna work for equity. Uh, they're gonna vest over two years. They're gonna accelerate vesting if you sell the company. Their role is to get you to that sale. All right, that's the thing. So you definitely want advisors. And who should your advisors be? Usually people that can introduce you to investors, right? You're not giving them success-based compensation, so don't tell me about broker-dealer. You know, that's not what you're doing, but there are people who know investors and know that community, people that can help you with the business, that can tell you what pieces you need to put in place, what seats there should be on the bus, and maybe even help you fill those seats. Um, there are people that might have some technical knowledge it's great if you find an advisor who has, has industry expertise. I do a lot of work with the agriculture technology company. I love to see farmers advising those companies because they know what their market is and what people are going to buy. They have industry expertise. Same with fintech and banks. You know, you're not going to find many bankers, but that'll sit on a board. But if you did, it'd be great. So uh, you should have them early and often and they should get stock. And that stock should vest over a short period of time and hopefully within two years you will have gotten maximum uh, benefit out of them. Um, and somebody asked about what the board composition composition should be when you do a series seed. Um, my personal preference is I like to see three member boards after your first money in uh, even if it's series seed I know some are you're going to say don't give them a board seat that's why you do series seed but, and that's great if you can get away with it, but if you have to give them one of three, certainly no more than that. I like to see one of three at the preferred stock series A level. And keep in mind, by the way, your board should always know somebody's got to come off the board whenever you do the next round, um, whatever that next round is. So yeah, board composition three, one founder or a common stockholder, one investor and then one person who's either chosen by the two of you or is chosen by the common, depending what you can get away with in terms of negotiation. 
Okay, well, we're at the end of the questions. Those were some cool questions. Thank you for that. Um, at that point, I'm going to say thank you, audience, for being here. Um, thank you, uh, ID to IPO, for sponsoring, hosting, and making this possible. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Rob. That was a lot of good information. Roger, thanks for spending time with us and sharing your expertise. Audience members, thanks for tuning in, and thanks for asking great questions. See you next time.